It's winter now and skies are gray, but jihadis never skip a day. They kill and think they're serving God. As theology goes, that's really odd. So stand firm and be of good heart. Remember, they aren't all that smart. But one who is, is with us tonight, ladies and gentlemen, for this week in jihad, the great, the one, the only, the David, the Wood. David, welcome, and how are you? Hey, how you doing, Robert? I am just wonderful, David. It's Christmas season. Be of good cheer, et cetera, et cetera. Everything is marvelous. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm not goofing off here. I'm sending out the sending out the link to everyone I'm in contact oh, thank you. with here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody but even... I, I, I don't even know what we're going to be talking about. I haven't been seeing much of anything about jihad lately. I don't know where you've been looking, David. We have been inundated with so much jihad over at jihadwatch.org that we have doubled the number of daily posts. And we are still having trouble keeping up with everything. The jihadis have been emboldened since October 7th in a way that we have not seen in years. And uh, there is a great deal going on. So I suppose we should just get to it. Uh, but I actually... Actually, you you probably you might be covering this, but the only thing I saw is that that uh, that Canadian dude in the mall talking trash. That's about all I've seen so far. The Canadian dude in the mall talking trash. I got him, yeah, but okay. I also okay. I got a bunch of other Canadians. Did you see, for example, that the Canadians in another mall were having a demonstration, a pro Hamas demonstration? And they go and terrorize the little kids trying to sit on Santa's knee. Uh, well, since uh, I mean, since since Mary, since Christmas is literally worse than murder, according to our Dawa friends, uh, it makes sense why they'd want to s rescue kids from that. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually because they're dyslexic and they think they're sitting on Satan's knee. But anyway, uh, we should start with some good news. David, we got here. This is Abdul Abdul Nasser Ben Brika. Is that a is that a Zabiba or is that just a dent in his head? <laughs> I don't know that when you're talking about is it a Zabiba or a dent in his head? Is that really like an either or? I think that's a I yeah. think that's a Zabiba. And yeah, a dent he, in his head. Yeah, he, he's like, huh. Some of you, some of you unfaithful losers just have a, just have a smudge on your head. I bash my head so hard. I just keep a permanent dent. Yes, he does. It does look like a dent. Yeah. So maybe he was born. Maybe it's a birth Zabiba. Maybe it's Maybelline. Maybe it's Maybelline. Anyway, Abdul Nasser Benbrika is um, in Australia and he had plotted mass murder at sporting events, train station, and so on. And the good news about him this week is that he is going to enter a de-radicalization program. Oh, that's good. And so I think pretty soon we should elect Abdul Nasser Ben Brika to be Prime Minister of Australia. And uh, we'll put another shrimp on the bobby and everything will be all right. Uh, but what do you think about these de-radicalization programs, David? They'll fix everything, am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, of course, the assumption behind this is that Islamic teachings are actually wonderful and peaceful, as we uh, hear so frequently. And so the idea is if you just set these uh, jihadis down and show them what the Quran actually says, their hearts will melt and they'll realize that uh, they've heard completely wrong. And what the Quran actually says is if there if anyone kills a man, it's as if he's killed all mankind. So no terrorism there. And uh, there's no there's no compulsion in religion. And that, those are the only two verses in the Quran, Robert. The only two verses, you know, this yeah. you wrote it. Yeah, that's it. You know something, David, I was thinking about maybe making a new edition of the critical Quran that is the Western non-Muslim experts on Islam edition. That is people like George W. Bush, Pope Francis, uh, Hillary Clinton, the people who've told us over the years that Islam is peaceful. And it would have, there's no compulsion in religion. You kill an innocent person, it's like you're killing the whole world. Say to the unbelievers, you have your religion and we have ours. Uh, yeah. I think that would be about it. it, it, it so it. It's, we'd save some paper. Or yep. maybe we could just put put uh, blank pages and people could use it to write their own surahs like it. 
Yeah. And I, I've been talking about this with uh, with AP. There is this interesting uh, this interesting uh, thing that keeps coming up whenever whenever uh, anyone now quotes the Quran in any critical fashion, the response or mentions Sharia in any critical fashion. Like, you don't like Sharia. It's uh, oh, oh, are you an expert on Sharia? Tell us why, how you're an expert on Sharia. Or if you quote a verse of the Quran, they'll go, oh, OK, you're an authority. You're an authority in Islam to be able to speak on this verse. And it's just amazing because, the you know, for the past couple decades, as you've seen, any random person who has clearly never read the Quran, politician, every politician, every journalist, they're all completely competent to say who is and who is not a Muslim at all. They could they can mm. say, you see that guy doing that? Well, he's not a real Muslim. You see that ISIS jihadi slaughtering that Shia in the name of Allah? He's not a Muslim because the Quran says if anyone kills a man, it's as if he's killed all mankind. And so they could just pretend that the Quran doesn't say to wage jihad, not only against unbelievers, but also against hypocrites, which is what they believe they're doing. So they believe they've been commanded that in the Quran. Um, but every single, uh, I mean, every politician, every journalist for decades has thought, hey, we are able to say with, that who is and who is not a Muslim based on the, the two verses that we've heard. And yet the moment, the moment you say anything critical, like, hey, what about this wife being, oh, are you, are, did you graduate from Al-Azhar to be able to speak on this? Are you the grand mufti of Jerusalem to be able to make pronouncements on this? No. All right, then you can't, you can't talk. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Awesome. Wild. It's, it's, it's always this interesting situation where the less you know, the more of an expert you are. It's the only thing like that. No, no one says the less you know about mathematics, the greater the mathematician you are. No one says that. It's never crossed anyone's mind. But in Islam, the less you know, the, the more you the, the more of an expert you are. Uh, it's, a, it's really a great idea. Had the critical Quran. So we'll have the uncritical Quran that is uh, what nice. Western Muslims think is in the Quran. Nate D, Nate two D two just came up with the yeah. greatest bestseller of of all time. The un, <laughs> who wouldn't want Who wouldn't want a copy of the uncritical Quran? Like, it, <laughs> we could even, you, uh, you could have a subtitle like so. You have it: the uncritical Quran, the version used by uh, every politician and journalist uh, for the past uh, two decades, and then you just yeah. open it up, and it's three verses. And then, uh, uh, maybe after the three verses, all the other stuff that they think is in there that isn't in there at all. <laughs> you know, love one another, be kind, be uh, be good to your fellow man, no matter what. All the things mm -hmm. that they figure, well, it's got to be in there. It's a holy book. Yeah, I keep I keep hearing that from everyone, too. All religions teach love everyone. All religions yeah. teach this. All religions teach peace, blah, blah, blah. So, hey, why, why are we having all these disagreements when all religions teach the same thing? So we'll have to add it into the uncritical Quran. We'll mm -hmm. have to write a lot of surahs like it. Matter of fact, that's good. You can have the three peaceful verses uh, that are, of course, abrogated. But you could, you know, have you don't need the, the the verses that abrogate them. So you have the three peaceful verses, and then you have like a uh, two hundred verses that are just completely made up. Mm -hmm. Yep. So send in your entries, folks. Your Quran verses, your peaceful Quran verses, and we'll get the uncritical Quran going. All right. Meanwhile, unfortunately, uh, we're hearing again from Sheikh Yunus Kathrada in Canada. And uh, he is somebody we have heard from before. He has prayed for the annihilation of the Jews before. And this time he said, uh, let me find it here. Disbelievers, O Allah, destroy the enemies of Islam and annihilate the heretics and atheists. Uh, the dis Where is the disbelievers thing? Hang on, um, David, we're just having a little bit of a vision this problem, is, I suppose. Yeah. This is the proof. <laughs> oh, here we go. You will learn from this that the disbelievers at large, we are speaking in general terms, and this is exactly what is unfolding before our eyes, understand that they stand against Islam and the Muslims. So when they say that Israel has the right to defend herself, what they're saying is that the Zionists have the right to wipe out the Muslims of Palestine. O oh Allah, grant glory to Islam and the Muslims, humiliate the infidels and the polytheists, annihilate the heretics and the atheists. Anyway, where does he get the idea disbelievers are against Islam? Uh, I thought that we all loved one another here. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, yeah, they, they do get that idea. Interestingly, they get the, especially when it comes to Jews, they get that idea from the, uh, from the Quran, where the Jews are the most vehement in hostility towards the uh, Muslims. It is interesting. They keep saying, oh, they're trying to wipe everyone out. I mean, you've seen the statistics on the population of, of the Palestinian territories exploding for decades. Uh, which has led some people inept to, genocide ever the worst genociders of all time um, after every other genocide in history you see the population of the group that's genocided plummet this is the only genocide in history where the population actually explodes uh, while they're being genocided um, but me me and AP have been have been going through uh, some of the claims and some of the statistics Muhammad hijab famously was on Pierce Morgan mm -hmm. saying that for every for every Hamas member, that is killed 100 civilians are killed israel really? has a hundred a hundred to one ratio hijab was claiming this and of course no one knew where he was got it from so they didn't know how to respond to it they were uh, they were saying no made that, it that, up. That, that doesn't sound right well it's worse he actually is barely literate uh it, he got it from a headline and the headline had said um dozens of hamas commanders killed come he 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 apparently doesn't know what the word commander means um and then he did the math and said oh, okay he, he assumed this is the total number of hamas members at all killed oh does uh and then concluded oh so it's a it's a hundred to one ratio and this was his entire case um where the uh i mean the you know the the official statistics are going to take some time to sort out but uh it looks like it's closer to two to one, which is pretty common mm. in wars. And I, I'm actually impressed by that, given the situation that they go into, where you've got these guys dressed up like civilians. And so you don't know who's who's going to kill you and who's not going to kill you. Uh, and it's all in pretty cramped quarters and so on. So, I mean, I would have been impressed if it was like four to one or five to one civilian to actual members. And, and yet it's it's the same as. As, as like it was in World War II and so on. So anyway. Oh, it's actually better. Uh, in the Iraq war, it was nine to one, the mm. American troops in Iraq, nine civilians for one uh, one combatant. And of course, there, there are a lot of charges that the Americans were recklessly killing civilians. But the fact is that both the American and the Israeli army take great pains to avoid civilian casualties. But both in Iraq and in Gaza right now, the... Uh, the other side uses human shields. They try to launch their attacks from civilian areas to draw yep. fire that will kill civilians because they know how powerful civilian deaths are on the propaganda front. And yeah, so isn't for it... Israel to have a lower rate of killing of civilians in Gaza uh, is remarkable and shows how careful they are in this in this conflict. Yeah, that's a, I mean, think about what a nightmare situation that is. You're trying, you're attacking and you're trying to minimize civilian casualties, but the people you're fighting are deliberately trying to maximize civilian casualties. They want you to kill as many civilians as possible, which is why they hide among civilians and hide behind civilians. And so they want you to kill as many civilians as possible so that they can use this as part of their uh, PR campaign against you. And so you're fighting a war while you're trying to minimize casual civilian casualties and your opponents are trying to maximize them among their own group. That's a, that's a nightmare situation to be in. It is. And then the whole world, of course, is against you. And so you have the international media magnifying the casualty lists of your enemies. It's really incredible to me. But the UN every uh, day publishes the casualty figures that they get from Hamas, from the Gaza Ministry of Health. And they put them up as if they're completely factual, even though those figures themselves are ridiculous on their face. You can look at them closely and you'll see it pretty quickly, as a matter of fact. Like, for example, one day they'll have 300 more civilians killed, including, and then you look at the number of children, it's gone up by 600 since the mm -hmm. day before. So yeah. 300 people, including 600 children. And the UN is passing this on as if it's accurate. Yeah, Hamas could actually come out tomorrow and said, uh, uh, the IDF just did an airstrike. Um, in which 50 people were killed. Among those 50 people, 7 million children. <laughs> and and the UN would pass it on. It's, it's wild. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let's go to Nashville, Tennessee, David. In Nashville, Tennessee, yeah. this is 
the Kadoom, not Kaboom, but Kadoom family. Uh, this is Nick Kadoom over here, and his son John Kadoom, and his wife Rawa Kawaji. And they have another son, uh, Nick and Rawa, have another son besides John, who is not named in the available reports. And what happened was Nick and Rawa and John ganged up on the other son, started beating him and spitting upon him and threatening him because he converted to Christianity. What's wrong with that? Surely these people believe there's no compulsion in religion, right? Um, no, they don't believe that. Um, uh, yeah, so in Islam, the penalty for leaving Islam is death. Uh, you have lots of Muslims who would believe that you don't enforce that unless it's done under an emir. So that's that's Ali Dawa's view and so on. So you have Muslims who believe that you can only enforce these things when you have a sort of full full blown Sharia. But what you have, it's it's parallel to other issues, right, where in an Islamic and in an Islamic state, you can have a government enforced rule against criticizing Islam. In a Western nation, you don't have the same rule. You work towards it, but you can still enforce it in other ways. So you'll go about it by uh, labeling anyone who criticizes Islam uh, bigots and racists, try to get them canceled from their, you know, make them lose their jobs and so on. You try to get the same result without having the government enforcement. And so it, it's similar with, with everything else. If your son or your brother uh, leaves Islam, converts to Christianity. Uh, you don't uh, you don't kill him, but you try to get the same result because the goal the goal of the death penalty is to make everyone terrified of uh, of leaving Islam. You do, you don't want to do it, even if you do it, you keep your mouth shut about it and just live like a Muslim the rest of your life. Never let anyone know. And guess what? There are Muslims in the West who understand. Hey, the government's not going to sentence them to death, but we try to get the same result. Try to keep people terrified, absolutely terrified of leaving Islam. Yeah. Actually, I should have noted that they were trying to get him to recant and to take back his conversion. And so uh, he, what is scary about the available reports is that uh, Nick and John Kadoom were arrested. Rawa Kawaji actually uh, scratched, so the, the stories say, scratched his hand with a knife. And so she was charged with assault, but they were just charged uh, with lesser charges and got out more quickly. But there's no word about where the son is now and whether he's still living with them. And I think they should understand that he is in very serious danger if he's going back home and living with these people at this point. Yeah, and can you, and yeah, it's actually worse now because if he's now a public apostate, if, he's, if it's now a public issue, that is way more of a concern for them because then it becomes a massive man, a matter of family honor and stuff that you have to deal with this. And you know what the you know what the really messed up part of all this is, Robert? I mean, apart from you know basically torturing a kid for for leaving Islam, the messed up part is if uh, if this kid were to if the if the government were to say, okay, now your family's out of jail, so go back to your go back to your family. If this kid were to run away. And go uh, go into hiding with like a, a Christian family or something like that to keep him safe. And you and Pamela Geller were to say, "Hey, this kid needs to be kept safe." I think we have good reasons to believe that you would be absolutely blasted by the media and Muslim organizations and the parents, the parents who were torturing him, would be propped up as the ideal parents for all humanity. Uh, loving, doting parents, doting on there, and and this kid's making it all up because he's uh, he's been uh, he's been brainwashed by people like you. Uh, this kid would be blasted and harassed and and demonized. You guys would be blasted and and demonized. You think that's about right? Uh, I seem to recall something like that before. Yeah, you know, for those of you who may just be joining our program, uh, David is referring to a an incident in two thousand nine, if I recall correctly. Uh, 2009 or thereabouts, where a young girl in Ohio named Rivka Barry actually did that. She said she she was caught. She had been she had converted to Christianity. She had been practicing her faith in secret, 
but her father discovered her Bible, may have caught her praying, I don't remember exactly, but uh, in any case, he threatened to kill her, whereupon she did flee her home, and then there became it became this big custody controversy because she, like this boy in Nashville now, was underage. And so uh, Pamela and I tried to call attention to this. We were excoriated in the media. Niha Awad of the Council on American Islamic Relations uh, wrote an article explaining there was no real, no apostasy law in Islam, that Islam respects the freedom of conscience. It's funny how so many Muslims seem to misunderstand that, even to this mm -hmm. day. Uh, yeah, they keep, they keep misunderstanding Muhammad's words. If anyone leaves his Islamic religion, kill him. They keep they keep misunderstanding it and think and th they think that he means what he says when he actually he means the exact opposite. Just like Allah so often in the Quran itself. Yep. All right, uh, we have in. Why don't we go to Europe, David? Um, there's a lot of Europe stories. I'm not going. To, I'm not going to Europe. What are you talking about? <laughs> big giant Sharia compliant hellhole. I'm not going there. You were correct, oh, you mean, sir. You, oh, you mean for the news? Okay, yeah, we can do that. For the news, yes. All right, let's go to France. A lot of France stories this week. Um, in France, we have uh, police are investigating because in Paris, a man armed with a knife entered a Jewish daycare center. And holding his knife, he went up to the director, a woman, and said to her, You're a Jew. You're a Zionist. Five of us are going to rape you, cut you up like they did in Gaza. Now, surely somebody like that, that has nothing to do with Islam. Am I right, David? Oh, no, they're getting that from uh, Mars. Yes. We're being invaded so, by Martians. Also in France, in the, uh, uh, should I even try to say this? In a school. It was in a school. You can check jihadwatch.org for the name of the school. You're going to say I'll it? I'll say it. I'll say it. The Fifon, Fifon, Fifon School of Cheese and Corsants. <laughs> and Surrender. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Leon Mag reports that uh, this is an 11-year-old girl. And the 11-year-old girl is walking. They're, they're, they're walking uh, out of school in the afternoon and they uh this girl comes a couple of girls and they come upon this boy from their class now you know i uh, we were all 11 once and i remember that uh uh there was a lot of back and forth between the kids and particularly girls and boys and oftentimes of course the old cliche is if you tease a girl it's because you have a crush on her and all that and so maybe this girl has a crush on this boy what she did was uh wielding some scissors she said to him you dirty christian you are all the same dirty dog is it good to be a dog tomorrow i will meet you at the school and uh she's in love with that christian <laughs> Hey, yeah. so hey, hey, someone needs to someone needs to tell her. Someone needs to tell her she's not allowed to. Uh, she's not allowed to be dating Christians. Indeed, even yeah. with scissors. Uh, all right, we got a twelve-year-old girl in a different school in France. It's uh, it's girls and girl jihadis, preteen girl jihadis in France week. Uh, yeah, you need. Yeah, you need to put that on there. You're gonna get all these people who are total perverts looking for stuff, but they'll find it. <laughs> I'm not sure I want them looking. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, okay, we got a 12-year-old, and she brings a knife to school in 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 Ron or whatever R E N R E N N E S. It ain't Rennes, but anyway, and uh, she's a very polite. That's one thing you know. I've noted over the years of covering all this jihad that there are many many jihadis who are very calm, you know, and they calmly kill somebody and calmly say to police, yes, I killed uh, uh, this person and so on. And uh, they don't show any emotion. 
And people have found this curious over the years because they're used to this kind of thing happening in the context of a crime of passion. And they don't understand jihad, so they don't understand how somebody could be perfectly calm and think that they, and, and do this kind of terrible violence, but they don't understand that they think they're serving the creator of the universe and so on. Anyway, this girl was calm, but also polite. She showed the knife to the teacher who she disliked and said, I'm going to kill you, ma'am. And uh, explained that she wanted to imitate a jihad attack that had happened earlier in another place in France where uh, a 57-year-old uh, individual, Dominic Bernard, was stabbed to death in October by a jihadi from Chechnya. And so now uh, we have the jihadi preteen girl saying that she wanted to kill the teacher. Same kind of idea. Uh, I wanted to deal with this real quick. We've done this before. Why can't we have super chats, David? Uh, cause your channel's about jihad and you can't be, you can't have a channel monetized like that. So, uh, let's, let me make sure that the links are there in your description. Let's see. Yes, you can. Robert was at one point banned from Patreon when they, uh, concluded that anyone who is critical of killing apostates and so on has to be banned from the platform. Fortunately, they, uh, they changed their minds eventually. So you can support Robert on Patreon. And you definitely want to follow him on jihadwatch.org. And you can see Robert's written a ton of books, but you definitely need the ones that are listed there. Palestinian Delusion, Critical Quran, and History of Jihad. Those would definitely be my recommendations. So yeah, you can you can support the channel that way. So anyway, the uh, Super Chats you can only do if you're monetized. Jihad Watch was demonetized years ago, so we can't have that. But if you could support us at Patreon or donate to Jihad Watch, we would be deeply grateful. Help us keep going. And we will keep going now. So we're still in France. Wait, wait, wait. Are we just going to are we just going to uh, are, are we just going to walk past that uh, that clearly Islamophobic teacher who didn't want to be killed? Yeah, I guess we are. Uh, what a well, big tell us, What do you think? Um, yes, yeah, she should have said, you know, I thank you for being so polite and saying I'm saying ma'am yes and to show you how tolerant i am i have to let you murder me in the name of allah yes otherwise otherwise i, I just wouldn't be tolerant she also uh this this girl this 12 year old also gave a note to another t a student saying she was going to kill the teacher and the student laughed at her and said what do you mean you're going to kill the teacher and then the kid says but i did not know at that time she had a real knife yeah, and so you said this is a 12-year-old, so that, that note yes. would have been like, uh, hey, I want to kill the teacher. Do you think I should? If so, check this box. <laughs> Do you think I'm cute? Check this box. <laughs> All right, 14-year-old uh, Muslim. They're getting older. In uh, another school, yet another school in France. It's Jihad in French Schools Week. And uh, we have this guy brought a box cutter to school he's 14 years old and he starts chasing a couple of uh students around while screaming you'll never guess allahu akbar whoa yeah in the it's class weird. he placed the blade of the cutter on the stomach of one of his uh, schoolmates but did not hurt her and was ultimately uh, taken to the principal and handed over the weapon. Uh, what's interesting is that it's all the report also says that he was known to the police. So this is a 14 year old and he's already got himself known to the police for this kind of activity. And he's a knife wielding Allahu Akbar shouting uh, jihadi in school nonetheless. Mm -hmm. uh, I got another one for you out of France, David. We have a uh, another guy in what, Paris. What? What? Wait, what? Why is everything happening in France? Like the whole uh, the whole young generation decide. Uh, and and by the way, I mean, they, think about how nuts this this is, right? 
you say you've got you've got all these like 12 and 13 and 14 year olds deciding at that young age they have to go around killing people and it's still not it's still not entering people's mind that they've got a problem here that uh i mean one guess what those what's going to happen to those kids here, here's here's the most that'll happen to them yes. that's it that's going to happen to them is that going to change their views is that going to de you know is that going to tell convince them that no actually you need to be uh loving towards everyone of course not there you it, you've got multiple issues here one you've got why are these young people coming to these conclusions about what they're supposed to do two if these are the people if you see 12 13 14 year olds who are already deciding to do it guess what there's a much greater number that uh have those same ideas but they're looking towards the future to do it and then of course the fact that these these kids aren't going to be in prison for the rest of their lives so unless their minds change pretty radically you're going to get they're actually going to kill somebody at some point yep creepy uh and it's a it's a very good point that nobody in France seems to be following up on. I had never seen any mention of it in any of these reports, and I'm getting these reports out of the French media. We got the translations at Jihad Watch. The uh, French media never says a word about police looking into exactly the point that you've just made. What is it? Where did they get this? This 11-year-old kid, 12-year-old kid, 14-year-old, they're not find, reading the Quran and coming to the conclusion that they got to go jihad they're getting it from the parents the local mosque the environment that they're in and it seems as if the french are in complete denial about that as well as everybody else not just the french but it's a big french week uh paris all right guy with a kitchen knife 40 centimeters long says the french story what's 40 centimeters it's what I don't know how, how big that is, but I think it's pretty big. That's pretty long. Knife. Yeah, that's so, a big one. So we got, he's got this. He is uh, on the street in Paris and he is shouting. You'll, you'll, you won't believe this, but he's shouting Allahu Akbar. Huh. And he that's, says. That's original. <laughs> yeah, they never, uh, I know we've, we've been through this every which way. Uh, over the weeks and the months uh, it's just uh, these things are these stories are all the same but anyway there is a little twist in this one he did not just go around stabbing passers-by at random he actually asked a woman walking by say are you jewish and she said no and then he said you're lucky otherwise you would have taken it in the gut referring to his knife That's France today. Welcome to France. And uh, what do you think the odds are that things are going to be getting better there before they get worse, Robert? Yeah, I think that France is going to be a pretty unpleasant place in the next 10 or 20 years. Stick a fork in them. Uh, yep. Uh, here's another angle on that, as a matter of fact. Another story about France in the Jacques Cartier School in Issou, west of Paris. A, uh, a teacher showed a painting to her class. She's an art teacher. She showed an art. She showed a piece of art, a 17th century Renaissance painting, Diana and Acteon, by the Italian painter Giuseppe Cesari. Now the problem is the Italian painter Giuseppe Cesari. He painted nude women, David. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they uh, did that back then. Yeah, I was going to show the picture, but I figured, well, you know, I don't want to get this yanked from the YouTubes. Now, it's a 17th century painting, and I'll bet it's on the YouTube somewhere, but I also know that YouTube hates me, and so if I show it, you know, I'm running, r skirting the edge. So anyway, uh, it's a 17th century painting, nudes. If you're going to take an art class and it's going to talk about Western art, you're going to get nudes, and... The or if you art. or if you or if you just go to the Louvre or something like that, you're going to see all sorts of uh, nudes. Indeed, and uh, this is not pornography. It's 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 for artistic value. But in any case, the students said that they uh, were offended. The Muslim students, that is, and they accused her of Islamophobia because see, she was deliberately trying to provoke them by showing this picture. And so they have accused her of racism and 
They are enraged. I believe that, uh, yes, she is now in hiding in fear for her life. And why would that be, Robert? Well, I think they'll kill her if they get a chance. And this is because you don't insult Islam or Muslims. These things are death penalty offenses. And so that's what she's looking at. Of course, she was just doing her job, but France has changed. And uh, it's this is not the France that surrendered to the Germans in 1940. This is the France that is surrendering to Islam in 2023. Mm-hmm. And I mean... Uh, I mean, just just think about that. I mean, you've got now you've got any any Muslim student who doesn't like his teacher for any reason whatsoever can just then start walking around. This teacher's an Islamophobe, knowing knowing that teachers who get called Islamophobes can actually be brutally murdered, as we've seen. And so now teachers will have to go into hiding anytime they say something a Muslim student doesn't like. Yeah, you know, I got a story about that. Um, Let's see, where is that? I believe it might be, it's somewhere in Europe, David, so hang on just a second. Um, There was a story that was exactly like what you were just saying. And uh, might not be worth spending so much time on it when I can't find it, but... I don't remember the country it happened in, but the, oh, it was, it was in France. Yeah, here we go. It was in France yet again. Um, this is a story about a journalist, Ruth Elkreef, and a leftist French politician, Jean-Luc, Jean-Luc Melen, Melenchon, something like that, Melenchon. He called her anti-Muslim. And so she is now under police protection because getting called anti-Muslim in France, it's, well, of course, you get called anti-Muslim in America, you get demonetized and deplatformed and stigmatized and demonized. In Mm -hmm. France, you get death threats, and she is now under police protection. Ruth Elkreef. And uh... I got her picture right here. There she is, but don't, you won't see her on the street these days. Nope. And it's, uh, it's interesting because, you know, you see the results of, you see the results of this. Uh, I mean, it's worse in France because the mere accusation of being, you know, an Islamophobe can get you killed there. Uh, in, we've seen the results of this in the UK where, uh, police weren't going to be killed. Police and prosecutors and social workers weren't going to be murdered for, pointing out what was going on with the grooming gangs. Uh, They were just terrified of being called racist and Islamophobes for pointing out what was going on, that thousands of young British girls were being uh, groomed and uh, drugged and raped and gang raped and then pimped. Um, But they didn't want to they didn't want to say anything about this because you would be called an Islamophobe and a bigot. And we've been dealing with this for years. Fortunately, we have it much better in the U.S. as much as we will point out that, you you know, you get canceled and so on from deplatformed, demonetized and so on. Uh, We actually have it much better here in the U.S., which is why we're some of the only people that can still uh, speak freely on this issue. But, uh, you know, notice here, even with with CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, they're they're working towards the same goal of in, in, matter of fact we started we started off this uh, this episode by talking about this they have the same goal if you can't fully enforce Sharia and silencing all critics by just having them executed you just need to make everyone be in a state of constant uh, panic and fear about doing it and uh, they've been able to do that for a while just by calling everyone Islamophobes and claiming to be the victims and so on. Uh, I just wonder, is, uh, are, are people actually going to get past that? Because if so, what's your what's your plan B there? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, you remind me when you're speaking about what happened in Britain with the, with the rape gangs, that Britain was so far from allowing discussion of the truth, and I think this is where we're heading a little more slowly, but Britain is so far from allowing discussion of the truth. There was a politician there, Sarah Champion, I believe her name was, and she was part of the shadow cabinet. I think that's one of the coolest things that Britain has, that uh, when the, you, have, you have the government, but then the opposition party, or the, at least the main one, has 
uh, a person in every position that's the shadow secretary of transportation or whatever and they just nitpick and 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 argue with the guy who's actually doing the job and anyway sarah champion was part of the shadow cabinet but uh for the labor party the leftist party and said that the the rape gangs were almost entirely pakistani and she was made to resign and it was like she had said this terrible thing she didn't even come close to saying that they were Muslim, which of course they are, and animated by Islamic principles, which of course they are. She only said they were Pakistani, and she even said, oh, they're Pakistani Christians, as if there were Pakistani Christians among them, which they were not. And she got uh, so much heat for this, and she wasn't even getting close to what the real problem was. And so mm-hmm. that's that's where we're heading in America, this same kind of denial and willful yeah, it's, ignorance. Uh, and notice it's... It's the exact same thing over and over again. If you're in Pakistan and you criticize something to do with Islam, they'll just form a mob and kill you. Over here, a little bo- a little bit more difficult to do, but they realize they don't they don't even have to. They can just call you names and everyone backs down. Bunch of cowards. And and then and then politicians, the media, they'll all crack down for you. Oh, this person stated the obvious. Don't worry, we'll uh, we'll destroy this person's life because this person stated the obvious and matter of fact robert is it, are we talking about the same nation that wouldn't even allow you to go over there yeah as far as i know i'm still banned uh people have been asking me country. to write to the home office and see if the ban is still in place and uh it's one of the things that i've been meaning to do but it's kind of low on the list because it's not like i really am itching to go over there you know yeah, uh, but I mean, think about that. It's like, hey, every jihadi in the world who wants to come to the UK and uh, and spread the news that, hey, we're going to subjugate this entire place and uh, and conquer the world and uh, kill all the Jews and rape all the way. They can't get enough of that. Hey, so bring in more of those guys. If you want to say, hey, no, don't do that, you got to be banned permanently. Yep, yep. As a matter Pretty of fact... Small. I was right here in this office when the FedEx truck drove up and guy gave me the letter from the UK home office. He was very impressed. It was funny because the FedEx guy, you know, what does he care? But he he's hands me this letter and I'm signing for it. He says, it's from the British government. Wow. <laughs> oh, great. I, yeah. I hope you never get one, buddy. Yeah. Uh, hey. Oh, you, you should have, you should have, you should have been like, Huh, so they've got my new mission. I mean. (laughs) So the letter said, and I still have it up. You can read it on Jihad Watch. The letter said, you said that Islam has a doctrine of warfare against unbelievers. And we think you're going to say that again if you come over. So you can't come over. But if if you're a Muslim saying that that Islam has a doctrine of, of warfare against unbelievers, they, they roll out the red carpet for you. And make yeah, you, the uh, Saudi Sheikh, uh, I believe it was Muhammad Al-Arifi from Saudi Arabia, he was let in that very same week. And he had these blood-curdling quotes about jihad means break the bones of the unbelievers and so on. They let him in, no problem. Isn't By the way, isn't that amazing? I mean, you've got people like Ali Dawa who are yes. sitting there posting on YouTube that, hey, once we get our Islamic State, you apostates are dead. You're dead. We're going to execute you. They're the the wonderful people of society for saying, yes, we're going to kill you. If you are a non-Muslim and you say, hey, they have a doctrine of killing apostates when they're they're able to, you're an enemy of the state. Yep. (laughs) It's insane. Yep, it is. Britain is certainly just absolutely nuts. It's, it sucks uh, because I know there are all sorts of like people there who aren't insane and who they're just as repulsed by all this stuff and the grooming gangs and the way their government's doing it. And so it's, it's like these mixed feelings, because on one hand, I'm like, if you guys are doing this, you deserve it. If you guys are falling for this, you deserve it. If this is what you, if this is how you react to, uh, to, to grooming gangs and people walking your streets calling for killing apostates and stuff like that, if this is how you react. You deserve what you get. And yet there are just lot, there are lots of people there who, 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 they'll be attacked by the system too and so they're 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 forced into just keeping their mouths closed but man what a what a what a crap situation man i just Mm -hmm. hope i just hope when the dust settles on europe that other places get the memo oh look what just happened over there 
Do you yeah. want that happening here? Are you going to say the exact same things that France and Great Britain were saying the entire time they were being subjugated? Are you going to fall for the same thing? So hopefully, hopefully it at least serves as a warning. Well, Poland just uh, Poland has been resisting all this for quite some time, and now the uh, uh, left has taken over there, and they're going to open it up to the mass migration, and so Poland is going to become just like Britain, France, and Germany. Looks like. All right, uh, we have attacks on nativity scenes this week, and it is Christmas. By, by the up. way, by, by the way, on Poland, given the, uh, I'm not sure you heard the uh, Polish jokes when you were growing up, Robert. I certainly oh, yeah. recall them. Oh, yeah. uh, things like, uh, uh, you know, the Polish invented the first screen door for submarines and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But you would have mm -hmm. thought, you would have thought, given their reputation, they'd have been the first people to fall for it. And they didn't. And you Indeed. just you just have to think they it was it was still ingrained in their memory a little bit more than it was for for other nations. It was still ingrained in their memory because they fought it. They, they had to deal with it. They had to deal with uh, it was more for some reason it stayed in their memory what dealing with jihadis was like. And they're like, we don't want that. We do, we do not want that here. Yeah. Well, they're getting it now. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I have a story. It's already started. Um, yeah, there it is. Uh, there's a convert to Islam, an 18-year-old convert to Islam in Poland. And he uh, was plotting a... Oh, you know, this is going to be bad, David, because if they're going to start doing jihad in Poland, then I'm going to get this all the time. You know, in Zabkowicz Slaski uh, or some, something. Sorry, Poles. I don't know how to say this. But anyway, he was going to uh, do a massacre of police. And... Uh, he's a convert to Islam. You got to wonder. Whenever I see these converts, it's it's remarkable how many converts get involved in jihad and how uncurious authorities are all over the world as to why, if Islam is peaceful and benign and we got nothing to be concerned about regarding it, why do so many converts get it all wrong and think it has to do with violence? It is weird. It, it is, is weird how uh, they convert and then their first impression of their new religion is that they have to go slaughter somebody. I don't know. Weird. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Where do they get this idea? They must be getting it from you because <laughs> there's nowhere else to get it from. Yeah, that's it. They're, they're reading Jihad Watch and they think. Yeah, oh, they, con they convert and it. they say, hey, how do I need to live? And they say, let me go uh, check with the author of the Quran himself, Robert Spencer. And, ah, <laughs> I got to go kill a bunch of people. All right. In Belgium, we have beheaded nativity scene. You can see Joseph's head here at the base. Mary's head is nowhere to be seen. Uh, they also stole the sheep, which I think is kind of strange. I don't know what they're planning to do. But they I can tell them. you what I can tell you what those guys do with sheep, Robert. But these are it's ceramic. A, it's a family show. It's a family show. Ah, wow, ceramic I mean, they, sheep, David. Uh, maybe they're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see if uh, let's see what the uh, ceramic uh, sheep feels like. <laughs> Or at least I just stare at it. I just put it up on my shelf and I look at it. Like, uh. Yeah, sheep hub. Uh, all right. Only, only, only sheep. <laughs> uh, we also had a nativity scene beheaded in Germany. And this time they beheaded the cow. You can see that. Beheaded the wise men. They couldn't get Jesus because you may or may not know you put Jesus in the in the crib on Christmas Day, not before that. So uh, anyway, that's uh, another set of attacks that's been going on. Meanwhile, in Italy, a uh, migrant from let me see where he's from, a North African, it said he set a nativity scene on fire and uh, caused immense damage to the church, including destroying an organ that was built in the 17th century. All right, uh, we have, let's see what else we got here um, in the time remaining, quite a lot of stories of uh, stupid infidels, and we've already done some of them, but I thought this one was interesting. In Switzerland, David, in Switzerland, there was a, uh, an Algerian, a migrant from Algeria, 
and he was he applied actually to go to Germany, but the Germans wouldn't let him in. So he went to Switzerland. He went to a school. He screams Allahu Akbar. Threats threat makes threats at the school, and he's deported from Switzerland. But where was he deported to? From Switzerland, not Algeria. He was deported to Germany. Poor guy. Which was exactly where he wanted to go in the first place. Nice. So you gotta wonder if he was thinking that if he did this, then he'd be able to get to Germany when they had rejected him the first time. I don't know. Uh, Meanwhile, you have a, hang on. You you have uh, going back to your uh, your story about the the cow and the nativity scene. You have yes. some uh, you have some jokes over in the chat. Uh, you have yes. Labelle. Uh, I take the cow. Uh, Urban Infidel says Masab's cow. Uh, Sarah says they didn't choose the cow. I don't know if you know what that's talking about, but uh, no, what is that? You know the Green Prince, right? Masab Hassan Yusuf. Yeah, sure. Yeah, son of Hamas. Well, he made, he made this video, and he's trying to he's he's trying to warn jihadis that guys you don't you don't understand i'm not backing off just because you you talk a bunch of trash about me and stuff like that and he's like uh and so he starts he starts he just gets brutal and he goes if i condemn my own father to death you should be afraid right mm -hmm. and then he says uh if i have to choose between 15 million innocent jews and 300 million jihadi clowns I choose the 15 million innocent Jews. And then he goes, <laughs> like everyone could have been on board up through then, but then he said, uh, if I have to choose between 1.6 billion Muslims and a cow, I choose the cow. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if he, I don't know if he's, I don't know if he's being funny or what, but, uh, uh, people flipped out about that and it became an ongoing joke of uh, choosing the cow. Anyway, people, that's the joke people are making about uh, about the cow. And you're, uh, you're, you're, yeah, I had no idea, but maybe that's why they beheaded the cow. Yeah. All right. Also in Germany, though, David, meanwhile, in Germany, the public broadcaster NDR, they did a special on Christmas traditions. And they spoke about the Christmas tree. And they said, the origin of the Christmas tree is to be found in the Quran. <laughs> Wait a minute, Robert. So Christmas does have pagan origins. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, hey, send me that story, Robert. I want to send that to uh, to uh, in Inspiring Philosophy, who does a lot of Christmas stuff, and he can say, uh, he can say, well, I found out Christmas does have pagan origins after all. Okay. No, come Coming right up. Um, anyway, there. I sent it even as we speak on the air live, because otherwise I'd forget. Uh, the... It's interesting, though, that, you know, there's such a move in Europe to normalize Islam, to claim that Islam has always been part of Europe. Actually, Jacques Chirac, the former president of France, said that Islam has always been part of Europe. It's as much a part of the heritage of Europe as Christianity. And what they're trying to do, of course, is make people complacent about mass Muslim migration and not think anything of it. And so they have to just make up things like uh, there was one a few years back that the Vikings had Allah written on their belts and stuff and they were Muslims and uh, the uh, Christmas now, the Christmas tree is from Islam. It's it's all just ridiculous, but it's all just it's all designed for a purpose. And of course, the purpose is endorsed at the highest levels. There's another story out of Italy this week is that the Catholic Church has been funding the mass migration of Muslims into Italy from North Africa to the extent that migration activists have been boasting. They don't even have to work because the church has given them so much money. Nice. Yeah. Make 
I've, I've been saying for years, guys, if I ever become an atheist again, I'm going to pretend to be a Muslim. <laughs> People just hand me stuff. <laughs> yes, it's true. Uh, meanwhile, we have in France, we have uh, yet another story out of France. We have a woman who is a pro-migrant student activist. And she was raped by a migrant. And then, some days later, assuming that he was in prison, she's walking along the street and is shocked, shocked. to see him pass by. She should not have been shocked. This is France, after all. But yeah, and that's uh, yeah, that's pretty standard as far as uh, no repercussions. What do they know? They don't know any better. We bring them in there, and we you know we bring them in, we bring them in, and they have no idea that they're not supposed to go around raping people. So you can't hold them accountable. Indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, another story that's similar out of out of uh, France, of course, uh, Algerian guy, and he is deported, but he doesn't leave. And so uh, actually less than 1%, if I recall correctly, of Algerians ordered deported actually leave France. So there are all these people who've been deported walking around. And uh, this guy went onto a bus and he screamed Allahu Akbar and started threatening the bus passengers. I'm noticing a pattern here. Yeah, it's, it's weird. I know. It's weird. Who would have thought? In Sweden, a similar story. There were there were two migrants from Iraq. I believe I have them over here. Let me see. Yeah, there they are. Uh, this is the the newspapers got a what do you call those a watermark on there? But you can still see them. Um, this is Mazen Ashrash and Akar Bajarani, and they are Iraqis, and they uh, gang raped a woman and urinated upon her. And in response, they were sentenced to prison, but they were not deported. As a matter of fact, the judge said that they had integrated well into Swedish society. Well, I mean, the, ju the judge has got a point. I mean, if this is becoming the rape capital of the world, then these guys are just... just they're 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 going with it. They're going with the flow there. <clears throat> yeah, you know something else. They said Bajarani integrated into was deemed to have integrated into Swedish society due to the fact that he has two children who are Swedish citizens and is expecting a third. So it's mm -hmm. just that he went there and started uh, having babies. That of course he's going to raise Muslim, and they mm -hmm. think he's integrated into Swedish society. Yeah, and so. I mean, fortunately, those are girls and not a bunch of boys who would be raised with the idea that uh, you go around raping, uh, raping non-Muslim women. But if they have any brothers, they'll think that. Yeah, they will think that, and that'll be a family <clears throat> tradition. Indeed. Just like Pa. You know, there were father and son groups in the Muslim rape gangs in Britain. Yeah, there are lots of them. There was like brothers and cousins and uncles, and it was like a whole, it was a whole family affair, mm -hmm. which I, I commented on it way back then, because just thinking like, this kind of this kind of flies in the face of this idea that you can oh well you, you know anyone could just be crazy and want to or evil and want to go do something and uh yeah you can just have a random crazy person or evil person from any sort of background could be a, a christian or or whatever but uh i i happen to i happen to know that even though pretty much everyone in my uh, pretty much everyone in my family i'm trying to think my grandma would be the exception everyone has a criminal background of some sort in my family um, but I know if I, if I were to call up my brothers or something like that and say, Hey guys, uh, I got this 12 year old girl over here. How about we come over and just gang rape the crap out of her? Uh, there would be a brief, there would be a brief, uh, period of questioning of trying to find out if I'm serious or not. And, uh, if it turned out I was serious, I'd be getting, I'd be getting knocked out. I'd be, I would be getting knocked out by someone in my family for, uh, for if they, if they thought I was serious for saying something like that. And, uh, so just the fact that, uh, uh, oh hey hey we got this uh, we got this uh, twelve year old girl in our kebab shop up oh, let me call up dad let me call up my three brothers let me call up uncle uh, uncle Ahmed let me call up cousin Muhammad and they all understand hey yeah we'll go and uh, gang rape this girl and it's totally no it's totally normal to them no one mm -hmm. notice it never crosses anyone's mind <clears throat> wait a minute guys isn't this wrong 
Not a bit. Not shouldn't as far it, as shouldn't this be wrong? Yeah, it doesn't cross normal. doesn't cross anyone's mind. Hey guys, this is really evil here. I'm actually going to call up. I'm going to call up the police uh, for what you're doing here. Uh, never crosses anyone's mind. It is totally acceptable with the entire family and the entire community. Incredible. No problem. No problem though. All right, uh, another one like this out of Austria. A Syrian migrant in Vienna admitted in court that he had killed his wife and he had killed his wife with a kitchen knife uh, and he stabbed her 19 times because she wanted to split and uh, said that she had fallen in love with someone else. And so he killed her and it's a clear case of an honor killing where the honor of the man or the family is restored by killing the person who has the woman who has sullied the honor of the man or the family. Uh, and his lawyer, Manfred Arbacher Stoger, said she was the love of his life. This is a tragic love story. Just like Romeo and Juliet. Oh, yeah, exactly like that. Uh, but that's uh, honor killing. You know, we have to remember that honor murders. If you can prove that you have killed for to restore your family's honor, then you get a letter, lesser sentence in many Muslim mm -hmm. countries. I have the details on yeah. the story at Jihad Watch. And this guy will probably be made the new prime minister or something like that. They'll be like, oh, so, so honorable. He's so honorable. Indeed. Uh, speaking of which, uh, let's end up with this London cop because the picture of him is like the that meme you know of the guy pointing uh with his with his with his mouth open in in wonder it's something i've seen many times but anyway this guy is pointing what he's pointing at he's a member of the london metropolitan police and he is pointing at an israeli flag which people have put up in london in the middle of a pro-israel rally and he's saying the the flag has to go because we can't take sides Mm -hmm. uh, and you're you're on public property here, and, and you and you don't you don't even have to tell me, Robert, because I already know this man is completely consistent, and he also went around demanding that people uh, remove their palis you know their Palestinian flags. Yeah, the Palestinian flags. The, you, there are videos all over the place of Palestinian flags flying on monuments in London, of Muslims climbing up and putting them in the hands of statues and and covering the statues with kefiyeh, the whole deal. And they never did a thing about that, of course. But that's uh, shattered, staggering, dimmy Britain 2023. And that's where uh, I think we will end it up. David, it's been a pleasure. Uh, aside from the bleakness of the news, but uh, we go on. I wish you all, a, if you are Christians, a very Merry Christmas. And to all of you, uh, resist the jihad until next week pray hope and don't worry.